This is an interview of Jerry Pierce, a veteran of the U.S. Army. The date is July 11th, no, July 10th, 2011. Uh, we're doing this at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta. I am Roger Soyset with the Atlanta Vietnam Veterans Business Association, uh, doing this for the Veterans History Project and for the Library of Congress. Uh, Jerry, would you uh, please give us your full name, date of birth, and where you live? Gerald Joseph Pierce. My date of birth is December the 5th, 1937. I'm presently residing in Marietta, Georgia. I was born in Chicago, Illinois, and went to school there through university. Uh, how long did you live in Chicago? Born in 1937, left to go into the Army in 1958, okay. so uh, went back afterwards for some time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, after I was, uh, I, I was commissioned in June of 1958, I served for two years on active duty. I got out and was mobilized for the Berlin call-up for about 10 months and 25 days, and that would have been, I believe, in 1961. and. Uh, came back out, uh, got a master's degree in uh, 1967, and uh, requested to go back on active duty. At that time I was serving in a reserve unit, I was a captain, and I went back on active duty uh, in 1967. Were there others in the military in your family that you were following? or I had two uncles who served in World War II. One served in the Corps of Engineers, the non-commissioned officer in the European Theater of Operations, and the other one was assigned in the South Pacific as a part of the first amphibious group. Uh, my father was not drafted into the Army because he was a Chicago police officer, and uh, uh, my sister was born in 1943, which made him ineligible for the, uh, for the draft. Uh, you went to high school then in Chicago. Uh, St. Ignatius High School, and I graduated in uh, 1954. Uh, then I went on to Loyola University and attended Loyola University from uh, 1954 to June 1958. And on graduation, uh, I was commissioned. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, my basic pay entry date is the 11th of June 1958. What branch? Hmm? What branch were you? I was commissioned in infantry. Good man. What was the reaction of your family when you decided to go back on active? Well, I was single at the time, engaged, and I uh, talked about this with my wife-to-be, and uh, uh, I talked about it with my family. My family knew that I was eager to be in the Army, and uh, they recognized that as an infantry officer I was going to go to Vietnam at one point or another. And uh, certainly in 1968, infantry captains who were in great demand and uh, uh, there was no question I would go to Vietnam at one point or another. But they were supportive. Uh, like, I'd, I'd say the family as a whole is very patriotic. Uh, Fort Benning, were you, uh, you had the possibility of going into the airborne and other training? Did you no, I didn't go to any other schools at Fort Benning except for the basic course. Mm -hmm. uh, then I went back to, um, uh, took the advanced course mm -hmm. uh, in uh, 1964. So as a, as a reserve captain, I went through the, uh, uh, the resident uh, advanced course and uh, finished that up. Came back on active duty in 1968 and initially received uh, orders to Fort Knox, Kentucky, where I was a basic training company commander. I ran two cycles of trainees through uh, uh, basic training, and then I got orders to uh, for Vietnam with uh, initial duty going to the Military Assistance and Training Advisory, the MATA course at Fort Bragg. Uh, the MATA course was morning classes in weapons, communications, land navigation, military skills. Afternoon classes were in basic Vietnamese. And the 
the arrangement was in the Meta course that if you did well in the Vietnamese course, you could uh, go on for additional training at Fort Bliss. I did do well in the Vietnamese course. They sent me on to uh, Fort Bliss for an additional couple of months of training, which was six hours a day of Vietnamese in the classroom uh, mm -hmm. with labs and uh, spoken exercises. And the arrangement was that you were issued a tape recorder where you could play the tapes at night, hearing the utterances in Vietnamese, and record your own responses, and then play it back to see where you were pronouncing incorrectly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very, very effective way to learn a language. And certainly, when you're getting ready to go to a, a, a country where people who speak that language may be shooting at you, it's, you're motivated to learn the language, and I felt I was. <laughs> but there's one other thing that's very interesting. As a result of going to that school, I was in Fort Bliss going to school at the time the Tet Offensive broke out. And so, <clears throat> had I not uh, gone to that course, I would have been in country perhaps a month, month and a half, and certainly would have been vulnerable uh, based on where I uh, ended up going. So you were actually assigned uh, to a Vietnam unit in 68, late 68? Yeah, I was assigned to MACV. And so when I reported to Saigon, uh, to NACV headquarters. <clears throat> they had a brief familiarization program uh, in Saigon and, and uh, they sent you out for assignment. Uh, they, they gave you an assignment to an advisory team. I was assigned to advisory team 64, which was in Chao Duc province in uh, Mekong Delta. And uh, uh, Chao Duc is on the border, it's close to the border with Cambodia, the point where the Basak River comes from Cambodia uh, and flows down into the uh, into the Mekong River Delta. Mm -hmm. So I was in the Mekong River Delta. Uh, I flew uh, by a combination of flights. They took me out to the airport. You put your name down on the flight saying, okay, I'm gonna, I need to go to Canto. And that was the first step. You flew down from Saigon to the Delta. And then I stayed overnight there and went back to the airfield. You put your name in again. And I was able to get on a uh, uh, an Air America flight that was flown, it was flying to take people within the Delta. They dropped me off at a special forces camp where I stayed overnight uh, because somebody else had priority on the outgoing flight. And then I finally got on the airplane and flew to Chao And I was in the aircraft, fixed wing aircraft. Uh, it was a uh, Porter, uh, one of those short takeoff and landing aircraft. And I was sitting the row of seats behind the pilot, and uh, as we flew along over the Mekong Delta, I saw high ground rising ahead. And I said to the pilot, what's that? And he said, that's the Seven Mountains area of the Mekong Delta. He said, that's where you're going. So I was expecting flat terrain, but in the, in the best tradition of the military, surprise, surprise. They landed at the province headquarters in Chao Duc and taken a jeep in from the airport, and the the advisory team headquarters was in an old office building uh, close to the edge of the uh, Basak River. And so I uh, went in there and the command structure was, this was a Special Forces B team, which was running the province headquarters. Now, the location that I went to had been built by a Special Forces A team. And I'll come back to that, but the B team headquarters was actually commanding when I first came in. So they said, well, we have a couple of different assignments, and uh, I chose uh, to be assigned to the team in Tinbin. That's T-I-N-H by B-I-E-N. It's a small town that is on a canal called the Vinte Canal, V-I-N-H T-E Canal. That canal parallels the Cambodian and Vietnamese border about, I want to say, one and a half kilometers in from uh, from Cambodia. Hmm. So um, I stayed overnight. Uh, they set a jeep in, and I loaded all my stuff in the jeep and went to the uh, went to the camp at Tinbin. Uh, the the MACV had gone through a, a change in the way that advisory teams were. Uh, uh, were deployed and the Special Forces was moving out of the camps that they had built and MACV teams were moving in. So this was one of the first MACV teams 
that moved into a special forces uh, uh, camp. We had one radio operator on the team who was completing his term, who had served as a radio operator with the uh, uh, with the A team. But when I got there, the people in the advisory team were all MACV people, and it was a a team commanded by a uh, air defense artillery major, a fairly senior major who had, had enlisted service, and he had. Um, he had a heavy weapons NCO, and a light weapons NCO, and a radio operator, and a medic. And so the MACV team structure was similar to that of a Special Forces uh, Operational A Detachment. The difference was that we had never trained together, and we had to learn how to work together uh, without, the, uh, uh, without the kind of training that uh, uh, did. We had MOS proficiency in our individual skills. Uh, that senior officer uh, finished his tour and went home, and he was replaced by yet another air defense artillery uh, major. Uh, this man was a West Pointer, and uh, we uh, I completed the, my tour uh, with him and uh, him in command. So I was the second ranking officer in the team. Um, it's like the second two officers in the team, and uh, the camp itself. Uh, I caught myself extremely fortunate because I understand a lot of my colleagues went out into the field and were living in grass huts. Uh, it had uh, sheet metal uh, roof buildings. Um, the building that I lived in had uh, concrete block walls up to about waist height with a wooden superstructure. Uh, it was divided into rooms with uh, wood framework and matting walls, but above about seven feet. Uh, there was no matting, no walls or anything, and, and at night time the rats would run up and down the raft. Yep, yep. So, uh, but it was a very nice uh, nice facility. We had a concrete block building uh, with a tin roof that was used as a mess hall and a bar. Uh, the Special Forces had taken concrete and poured it into the form of a bar so that we could go in there. Eat. The interesting thing is, you know, they had an arrangement of pegs inside the door so that you could come in and take off your web gear and your weapon and hang them on pegs uh, while you were in the building. And you could get them in a minute, but uh, uh, it rather warlike appearance for everybody. We had, um, we had an impressed fund and we could hire and did have employed a couple of Vietnamese uh, employees. There was a woman who cooked, uh, cooked for us and they called her Ba Dep, which is pretty lady in Vietnamese. Uh, and uh, then they had a, a, a man who did a, a lot of odd jobs for us as well. And one of my duties was to manage the impressed fund and pay people uh, and keep a log of what the expenses were. We had a 15 kilowatt generator that worked very well, but the Vietnamese kept plugging all of their house lights into it and every once in a while the, <laughs> the, uh, the generator would stop and we had to get a local mechanic and, and come in and, uh, and get it running again. So. Uh, the Special Forces team had built a large cistern uh, so that we actually had a water system with water. Uh, uh, they would take a five-ton truck with a tank on it down to the Basak Canal and pump water from the canal into that and we would then put it into the cistern where it was run through a water purification system. So as I said, the camp was really remarkably well uh, put together. The people we were advising actually two different advisory tasks. One was to be the advisor to the district chief, who was a Vietnamese uh, a Vietnamese captain at the time I arrived, but he was promoted to major. And we also had a regional forces uh, light infantry battalion. Uh, the Vietnamese term is Lindoi, L-I-E-N-D-O-I. And it's basically three rifle companies plus a headquarters with no heavy weapons to speak of. And so uh, there was one of those companies that stayed in this camp, there was another that was broken out into platoon-sized outposts, and a third one that was assigned uh, outside the district. Uh, the regional forces were like the American National Guard. They only served within their province, they only served, you know, they couldn't be take, taken elsewhere to uh, uh, to do and uh, every once in a while we'd have joint operations with other districts and other 
uh, Vietnamese uh, uh, regional forces units would uh, uh, would come in. The company that was uh, in our camp um, was commanded by a, a first lieutenant, and uh, he was a, a Cambodian. Uh, we're on the border between Vietnam and Cambodia, so we have Vietnamese soldiers and Cambodian soldiers, and they're pretty much intermixed. Uh, but physically, Cambodians look a lot different. Cambodians look a lot like South Asians, like somebody from Bangladesh or uh, or southern India. Very dark skins, very straight, glossy hair, and no epicanthic fold, so they don't have the uh, the slanting eyes. But uh, they spoke Khmer, uh, and of course the Vietnamese soldiers spoke Vietnamese. So, uh, uh, but this uh, this unit would go out on operations, and of course we would uh, we would accompany them uh, uh, on operations. Did you have difficulty in the communications with the different languages? No, because we had a Vietnamese interpreter, and uh, I got to use my Vietnamese language every day, but I really have to depend on it in in urgent situations because he was quite fluent in English. So uh, and it was Sergeant Myung, and uh, he was from Saigon. And so he was kind of the city boy, and these these other people were kind of rural people. He was a little more, a little more, uh, but polished than the uh, uh, than the other guys were. But we would periodically go out on operations, launched to go out into the uh, uh, into places in the district, to villages, or down to uh, 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 there was an area to the south of us. Uh, probably should talk about the district a little bit because it's a rather strange arrangement. Uh, this canal, the Vinte Canal, at one end of the district there were a set of locks on the canal. The canal had originally begun in the 1800s by the French, by the, uh, by the Annamese, and then later when the French came in they put a set of locks in so that vessels could actually come up a river, go onto the Vinte Canal, and then go all the way to the province capital at Chowda. <clears throat> so they could actually go from the province capital uh, with, a, with a deep sea type of vessel uh, all the way down to the South China Sea. And of course the locks were a strategic item and there was a fort built there, an outpost that was built to guard that fort. Mm -hmm. And they had, uh, had a company there of, uh, of RF that were, were part of those regional forces. So, uh, was there ever an attempt to uh, destroy those locks? No, we didn't have any, any attacks. And, and again, this is immediately post Tet 68. It was relatively quiet. Now, after I, when I got into the, uh, into the team, uh, we went out on an operation about a week or a week and a half after I'd gotten there and came under fire. The first time under fire, uh, we would, had gone out with this long column of infantry. We were, we wound through some jungle on our way to, uh, uh, to the objective that we were uh, we were approaching across a little field and came under fire from the, from the right flank in the AK-47 fire. And uh, I remember very clearly that, you know, there's a mental process that says I'm being shot at, I had better, you know, but by the time that mental process had finished, I was already on the ground. Yeah. Your, your reflexes respond very, uh, very quickly. And so, uh, it was really harassing fire. I don't think they intended to hit us, but we deployed and, and went after them. Of course, they ran away and disappeared. The, the way contacts usually happened is we would run into them one way or the other, and shots would be exchanged, and they would break contact, and very often just withdraw to Cambodia. They would, they would disappear and eventually go back into Cambodia. So every once in a while, we would set up an ambush in these rice paddies, which are, you know, this is... The area that I was in, the camp was at had a hill in it. It was built in and around the base of the hill. So you had uh, a bunch of uh, buildings, a berm, uh, barbed wire, mines, and, and a perimeter. And then the hillside was sowed with anti-personnel anti mines and barbed wire and booby traps. And they had a mortar pit with a four deuce on the roof on, 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 the, uh, on the top of the hill. So we were able to defend ourselves, but the camp never came under attack when, uh, uh, when I was there. And so we would go out on different, uh, a different operation. We went out on an operation, I was talking about the canal, let me go back to that because it's important. The district 
is a long narrow bar along the canal and at the bottom where the canal makes about a 45 degree turn and heads to the uh, uh, heads to the west um, there was a another outpost and we had an American MAT team military assistance uh, training team uh, as a captain and a lieutenant and a, and a couple of enlisted men who were down there working with the unit that uh, uh, that were there. They uh, were close to a piece of high ground called Nui Jai, which in Vietnamese means Long Mountain. And uh, we had another piece of high ground in the district that was also called Nui Jai. And the Vietnamese had big Nui Jai, Nui Jai Lun, and little Nui Jai, Nui Jai Nha. And so uh, uh, these people were near the base of this, uh, this hill, and every once in a while they would come out of their bunker in the morning and take sniper fire. So they would receive harassing fire uh, when they, uh, you know. but the, you know, we, we went out in operations. Uh, uh, we also, I mentioned, I should not mention this, uh, we had a Navy corpsman who was a dental technician and we would go out on bed caps and go mm -hmm. out and, and do medical visits and this guy would go out and examine the teeth of these people and do simple dentistry tasks. And uh, So you provide security for the village while he was Mm -hmm. Doing medical service, yeah. yeah, and it's you know it's um, we went out to, we went out one time uh, later on as we had been there for a while. Uh, one morning I wake up and there's a guy standing next to my uh, uh, next to my bunk and he said I said who are you? He said I'm your SEAL team leader. The Navy you know, Admiral mm -hmm. Zumwalt's uh, activities they deployed an LST and they moored the LST in the canal south of of Chowduck. And they nested a bunch of river patrol boats on it, and they've deployed the river patrol boat division in the Vinte Canal. So they uh, they had these water jet powered uh, patrol boats that went up and down the canal, and uh, we went out one time with them to conduct a, a an election, and uh, uh, took the PBRs down. At, after that 45 degree turn, the canal went west to a, uh, a, uh, a town called Jiang Tan. And Jiang Tan was the limit of our, of our district, but it was actually supported by a Vietnamese Special Forces team, which had a base after the 45 degree uh, turn. So we went out. The, the, place where the election was being held was at a schoolhouse across the canal from the Vietnamese Special Forces uh, uh, base. So we went and visited the Vietnamese Special Forces uh, and they uh, let us uh, practice shoot a couple of RPGs and uh, uh, when we arrived the Special Forces, the Vietnamese Special Forces had been well trained uh, by the Americans because they immediately gave us cans of cold Budweiser. <laughs> so this you were impressed with the Vietnamese Special Forces? Actually, they were they had they were professional, you know. And, but it was one of those things. Uh, it should be obvious in the nearer to this point is that there were a lot of conflicting jurisdictions and different people mm -hmm. operating, and so uh, it wasn't always easy to to do things. When the PBRs first got onto the canal, we they had to negotiate with the Vietnamese because the people who lived on the canal had their latrines on stilts out over the water. The PBRs came by. <laughs> so they had to learn. The other thing is, obviously there's a lot of silt in the bottom of the canal and the, the PBR people had to learn they had to frequently change the filters for the water jet system or they would jam up. So, uh, But when we went out to do this election, I have some pictures of the PBRs going down the, down the canal away from, uh, from uh, uh, habitation and they, they moved along with a pretty good clip. And, uh, uh, and went out. But so you had the, the Navy there with the PBRs, and uh, uh, we would have, um, we'd go out on various operations. Uh, we went out on an operation one time, and at, in addition to the ethnicity issue, you probably don't talk a little bit about religion, okay? You had to be, Vietnam is a Buddhist country, okay? But there are different kinds of Buddhists. Uh, we had, I, I think, five or six different varieties. We had, Probably the the, uh, the, the Hugh Gia, 
which is a sort of a Confucianist Buddhist. We had Hua Hao, which are fundamentalist Buddhists. Uh, and we had Kao Dai, who are eclectic Buddhists. Okay. Fundamentalist Buddhist means that very simple, very uh, simple ceremonies, uh, and the, and the Wahao were absolutely ferocious anti-communists. And the story behind that is the Wahao were centered in a province further down the Mekong Delta. And they were led by a man named Win Fu So. Win Fu So uh, was the leader of the Wahao. And the communists invited him to a meeting, mm. and he was never seen again. And so the Wahao were were very ferocious. I mention this because we went out on this operation with the uh, the company of, of Wahao who came from the province headquarters and we were there uh, sort of along with them and they began to uh, waterboard prisoners. Uh, they took them into the well and dumped their head and held them up and <laughs> brought them back up and so forth. So, uh, uh, but they were they were pretty good. But going back, the cow die, the cow die what I mean by eclectic Buddhist is that um, they had a pantheon that included European figures. Marshal Liao Te, who was a colonial governor in, in uh, North Africa, Victor Hugo. Uh, the, you know, I mean, that, the, they had, they said everybody can be a saint in, in our religion. So, uh, and, the, and as I said, the Hyungi. Then we had uh, Chinese animists, and uh, there were a few Catholics, uh, and uh, uh, I heard, but didn't ever see that in the province capital there were probably some uh, uh, Muslims as well. And remember, you can, even you know, the Mekong and the Basak River are navigable waterways and so they lead into the South China Sea and other cultures that are uh, around can be, uh, can be represented. But uh, yeah, so we had a lot of different, uh, a lot of different operations as they say. We, they would get into, into firefights and the, and the bad guys would always run away to, uh, uh, to Cambodia. Now the PBR people went out into areas where uh, there weren't necessarily uh, people around, and the uh, the Navy corpsman, who was the dental technician, wangled the ride along with them, and uh, they managed to get into a pretty serious firefight. And he was uh, uh, he was on deck giving uh, first aid and got a bronze star for uh, uh, for his bravery. But uh, uh, you know some of these stories. Another. One of the teams. Uh, oh, we, we. The other thing is the because the Navy had the had the LST in uh, in the uh, in the river. They deployed uh, Sea Wolf helicopters, and uh, typical Army uh, helicopter pilot was a warrant officer. A lot of them went through warrant officer candidate school. Yeah. Nineteen twenty, you know, young guys. Yeah. Navy pilots were commanders and with thousands of hours, and the Navy chiefs had apparently rigged up a way to mount a 50 caliber machine gun in a UH-1H. And by the book, that's not possible. It's an aluminum aircraft and it should shake them. Uh, yeah. But apparently the Navy chiefs came up with a way, <clears throat> and these people asked us if they could establish a rearm point at our compound so that they wouldn't have to cycle back to their landing point if we could get back. So the SEAL team went out and, and got into a firefight, and the, uh, uh, they came back and reloaded with rockets and ammunition and went out, and uh, uh, they could go down a tree line and just work it because they were very steady pilots. It was, a, it was an interesting additional thing. Fine point. Uh, we had Thanksgiving, and the Army issued us turkey rolls, and the Vietnamese lady cooked up the turkey roll and we had dinner. The Navy sent real turkeys and ice cream, and so uh, we were a little envious. They let us; they shared the ice cream. They were good about it. But uh, yeah, but it was a really interesting thing to see uh, the different kinds of things that went on and the different things. I wrote into uh, an outfit that uh, sends supplies and tools to villages, and I forget what the what the charity was. But they, they sent some to a village, and we went out to the village and, and actually presented them with these hoes and shovels and uh, uh, shovels and stuff. That was on mm -hmm. my own my own hook. But they they marched me out there and, and made sure that I saw that they were really uh, really delivered. We went out one time on an operation. Uh, there was a road junction between us and the capital, uh, the, the province capital, and the road junction was called Nyabang, and at Nyabang. Uh, 
there was an area which the Vietnamese told me was VC family housing, that the families of Viet Cong lived there, and of course the VC came back at night to visit their families, but in the daytime. And so the operation was a hammer and anvil. Um, there was a road that went this way and a road that went this way, and we were making a sweep in this direction. But the Vietnamese uh, changed the plans, which they feared had been compromised, and instead of going from that way to this way, they went this way to that way. And immediately after they launched into the operation, they were able to detect a large landmine that had been placed at where they would have been at the end of the uh, end of wow. so, uh, uh, did But going through the VC family villages, there were a lot of people who sat there and gave us the bad eye. You, know, you felt some tension in the air as you went through the areas. But it's interesting, too, to the experiences when you go in Vietnamese villages. Uh, families, farm families, you know, everybody works. Um, you walk through a village, and this is still, this is 1969, and as you go along, you see an old man squatting, taking a piece of bamboo and a sharp knife and shaving off slivers that you can weave into a bamboo mat, okay? and. Next to him is a, a naked child playing in the dust. The grandpa's watching the kids, but meantime he's doing mm -hmm. something. Everybody in the family is involved. Uh, trying to think about, you know, oh, uh, students. Uh, the Vietnamese educational system has a Bach 1 and a Bach 2, which uh, Bach 1 is grad, but grade school and Bach 2 is high school. So I'm, I'm not sure if that's. Uh, that's correct, but there are two levels of education. Mm -hmm. And they had the Bach II exams at the local school. And uh, we went by there, and all of the families are clustered outside the walls of the school waiting for the students to come out. And, uh, you know, uh, they're just watching what was, uh, what was going on. One of the things listed on your uh, biographical form is a silver star. Mm, that's not correct. Well, I have two bronze stars, and I have a silver service star ah, okay. for the campaigns. Because of the two tourists, you know, I have the, I have okay. one silver service star uh -huh. and one bronze star. And the bronze star for the first tour was meritorious, but for being there. Right. Okay. I did get a Vietnamese cross of gallantry, and that was for actions. Would you uh, care to elaborate on what? We went, out, we went out on an operation. Um, the Viet Cong had uh, a hillside above a Hua Hau village, and we went in and uh, maneuver up, maneuvered up the hillside, and they broke contact and got out of there. But for a while, I was on top of a hill uh, near their directing, direct aimed artillery fire. They brought a 105 howitzer and set it down in the road, and were shooting at the hilltop, and I was calling the fire on it, so it was a uh, Vietnamese gave me a cross of gallantry for that. How long would you typically be out on a on, on an operation? One or two nights. It were really not huh. long. Uh, we'd go out, camp out. One time we camped out in the Pagoda grounds. Uh, you know, we would camp out in the, in the Vietnamese village and uh, if you're the visiting American and you're, you camp out, they give you the bed, which is a wooden one with a, a wooden pillow. And they did that, and I lay down on it for a while. I said, "Can I please just sleep on a cot?" <laughs> <laughs> it was, I couldn't sleep on it. But it was, it was one of those things. Uh, uh, that was in Jiang Tan. We were out there uh, on, on a visit, and uh, they offered me lunch as well. And uh, you guys are sitting there eating rice and meat. And uh, I looked at him, and they smiled, and said, they had the puppy there. I said, his brother. No, they were having dog. In Vietnamese, you know, the, they, they had a couple of dogs in the compound, and one of the dogs had puppies. And boy, the Vietnamese were checking out the puppies. This is, you know, fresh meat. So it oh, is. Boy. Yeah. But, um, yeah, food-wise, uh, yes, you will get a big dysentery. And when you do, uh, you won't be doing anything. Thing else. Uh, I tell my students that the amoebic dysentery is the world's most effective reducing diet, but I don't recommend it. <laughs> so, 
Uh, all four types of malaria were endemic in the district that I was in, and in Mekong Delta. So we had to take chloroquine and primaquine. So if the big dysentery didn't clean you out, the chloroquine or primaquine did the same thing. I think the idea was that if you had any bugs, it would automatically flush them out of the system. But I remember that being, you know, I was I was fairly thin when I got uh, I got back. Probably should talk about how I came to be wounded. Uh, that's uh, we went as I mentioned they had uh, a bunch of different outposts and we had an outpost that was on Little Nujai, and this outpost was probably a platoon size outpost, and uh, these are regional forces uh, soldiers they bring their families with them, so they're camped down in this little uh, outpost. Uh, top of the hill. So we get to the hill, you, you leave the compound, you go a couple of miles down the road, you go up a trail and, and think of, uh, let's say, a, a north-south alignment. And you start at the south end, you work your way up on a ridge and you go through a bunch of dips and valleys and at the end of the ridge there's a drop-off with some low ground and some high ground beyond it. Uh, we did this. And one of the things the Vietnamese did with us is we stopped and sat down on some rocks and the Vietnamese major came up and just raised holy hell with us. They said, that was my radio. I was there. When we were in an operation, you and a radio operator, that was it. You were the entire, entire presence. But uh, we sat down on the rock. He, he said, don't do that. He said, don't step on anything. You know, don't, don't sit on a rock. Don't do anything. And we, we had done this periodically. This was the second or third time we had been up into this... Uh, into this area, but uh, the Viet Cong knew that we came into the area and they, they booby trapped it. We, uh, column moved out into an open area on the nose before this drop off. And as the column came out, it spread out, uh, the head of the column. My counterpart, this Cambodian uh, uh, officer named Chow Ping, went to the right. Uh, I went to the left with my, uh, my RTO. Uh, and about six or seven Vietnamese soldiers went into the center area. I stopped and leaned forward to lay my weapon on the ground, and the next thing I know, I am flying through the air backwards. Hmm. Uh, my RTO is blown this way, I'm blown straight back. The Vietnamese soldiers in the middle are taken out. Uh, I believe that it was a 155 howitzer round. And, uh, one five five howitzer round had the normal bursting radio, radius about uh, what fifty meters. Okay, so uh, the yeah. kill radius. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I have a friend who's an artillery battalion commander. He says fifty meters, but uh, I think it was a one five five howitzer round setup. I believe what they did was put it between a couple of rocks, because the way that the blast deployed was in a fan. I was very lucky because I was on one side of the fan. The Cambodian officer was on the other side of the fan, so the guys who were in the middle yeah. uh, took the brunt of the uh, uh, brunt of the blow. Probably should mention why I say 155 pilots are out. We had fire support from a Vietnamese artillery battery which was in the adjacent district and every once in a while we would put in a call for fire and they would fire a, uh, a sighting shot and you would hear the round go over and it would go off. And we suspect there was a VC on the crew, and all he had to do is not screw the fuse in all the way, and the round would be launched, but it wouldn't go off. And his buddies could go out and find it, and take whatever you know explosives in and uh, and create them. The thing. So uh, I had both eardrums blown out. Uh, got some scratches from from rocks. Uh, rock hit me, and they, hit, and they got you know some. Origin they originally blow, reported back that my nose had been blown off, but I was. You know, it was very, very lovely. My RTO was just, uh, I couldn't hear, um, I couldn't see him, I thought he was dead. He couldn't see me and he thought I was dead. But they pulled us down and, and uh, got us back down off the uh, off the mountain and went back in and uh, uh, didn't really need much emergency uh, uh, treatment, but I went to the province headquarters. They had no American medical uh, in, in my area, I mean medic, but not uh, not doctors, and there were American doctors working at the province hospital on, a, on some kind of a uh, some kind of a program. They went in and examined my ears; and both eardrums had been blown out, and uh, uh, unfortunately, because of the contaminated water, I developed an infection, 
and they looked at it and decided I was about 10 months into the tour and they decided they were going to better back me to, uh, uh, to Japan. And so uh, left the team, packed up my stuff, went back, uh, medevaced to uh, to Kanto. The, 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 the uh, first step I was in an evac hospital there, and they took me to the evac hospital in Saigon, mm -hmm. and then and from there to the uh, to the hospital in Japan. Uh, the thing that I remember about the hospital experience is when I went into the evac hospital in Kanto, they took blood. When I went out, they took blood. When I got to the one in Saigon, they took blood. When I got to Saigon, I got to Japan. I get tired of losing, uh, losing blood. Uh, but uh, they looked at me in the hospital and they said, uh, the left uh, eardrum is, going to, is healing naturally. Uh, the right eardrum is going to require surgery. You're two months from the end of your tour, we're going to send you back to the United States. And so I was medevaced and went back, and, uh, and we flew into Alaska, then we flew into McCord, uh, and then they got us, put us on a DC-9 and flew us to the Midwest. Because I was from Chicago, I ended up at the U.S. Navy Hospital in Great Lakes, and that would have been, uh, it says down here, uh, June of uh, 1969. Uh, I was, uh, uh, I mentioned I was, engaged. I was supposed to get married in August. And so um, I ended up back at, uh, at Great Lakes. Uh, and they had to clear up the infection. And since I didn't have any other, other medical problems, I was released to come back on an outpatient basis for periodic treatment. They stuck a swab in there with, uh, with antibiotics and uh, did. And once the healing was satisfactory, they said, we have to be sure of this because if we close it up, and the infection's still in there, and it's, you know, serious consequences. So they cleared me to be operated on, and they took a small patch of flesh from above my right ear and put it across the eardrum, and uh, see lit up. Navy Lieutenant Commander uh, did the operation. I've never had a problem. It healed normally and, and, uh, and so forth, except that in the high end of the voice frequency range, I can't hear very well. I have hearing aids that I have from the VA. The VA has given me a non-compensable uh, uh, disability. I mean, they don't get any money, but I do get free hearing aids and free batteries. And so uh, I've gone through a couple sets. Uh, I, I called the VA about bl last year sometime, and I said, I'd like to replace my hearing aids. They're not working very well. They said, well, when did you get the last pair? And I said, seven years ago. They said, those are as old as Methuselah. Yes, you can you're gonna get new ones. And so I have new, more powerful hearing aids that I'm very happy with. But uh, yeah, that, that, was, that was how I got wounded. On your return, uh, and you said that was August? No. Uh, I, I came back in, uh, came back in June. June. Yeah. Okay, August was when you were originally going to get married, I guess. August the 2nd. Yeah. yeah. And that came off? They came off. All right. They came off. And I was on convalescent leave. I had to I had to take pills, uh, but I went off and I got married and uh, everything. You know, it, it, that came off very nicely. Do you have any particular memories of your reception, uh, good, bad, indifferent, when you came back? Because we were on a military facility, I didn't have to walk through any airports. Yeah. Uh, both my brother-in-law and both my brother-in-laws uh, were draftees and came back. Uh, my my wife's brother was called the baby killer in the airport, and uh, uh, he's still angry about that. He's a fairly peaceable man, but he was a finance clerk. He drafted right out of college. I remember but I was still in the U.S. when he was drafted, and I remember my fiancé leaning out of the window crying. You know, her brother was going to, you know, he said, yes, it's nonsense. He's a college <laughs> graduate. He's not stupid. His class at Fort Benjamin Harrison had 44 students in it. Forty-three of them were college graduate draftees. You know, the Army in Vietnam with draftees did a marvelous time because they read the regulation, they understood the regulation, the Army worked very well with all these uh, people who were college graduates and, and draftees. Uh, that's, it's one of, the, uh, one of those myths about Vietnam that the, uh, they were all 
know, high school dropouts and uh, yeah. and smoking pot and uh, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Just not not so. Well, speaking of drugs, was there any incident you ran into? The in Vietnamese that would smoke opium, and if you, if you remember the parachute flares and the aluminum tube mm -hmm. you know, smack the bottom yep. and the flare would go up. You can take the expended tube and put a bamboo stem on it and, a, you know, and some water There's and work up a little, <laughs> their, their version of a ball. Yeah. So they, you know, and they would, they would uh, you know, you'd see them sometimes passing them around. But none of the officers that I saw were, uh, were the, the only, uh, only sort of, of uh, chemical relaxer is uh, alcohol. And we had beer was beer was fairly red, uh, readily available, and uh, when we went to uh, events, it would be uh, also readily available. You know, Vietnamese bao mui ba, and uh, uh, and regular American beer. So uh, it depended on uh, what was available. When you came back, uh, as far as your continuing an active duty, was there any? Question about that because of your injury? No, I was I was uh, discharged as fit for duty, and uh, mm -hmm. I I was reassigned. Uh, I, I requested uh, assignment to uh, uh, back to uh, you know, back to some place in the in the U.S. and they assigned me to Fort Bliss, Texas. I had been in a training unit before going overseas. I was assigned as I had been promoted to major while I was in Vietnam. I forgot to mention that, but uh, I was assigned to a, uh, a training brigade as the S1, and was there for four or five months. And the training brigade was closed down, and so I'm now an infantry major on an air defense artillery post. What do they do to me? Well, the Vietnamese, the Defense Language Institute where I had gone to school for the advanced course was on Biggs Field at Fort Bliss. And they had lost their S3 who had been sent back to Vietnam. The rule at this point, this is 6970, was that if you were an infantry officer, you had 12 months and they would send you back again. And so um, I, I did end up going back after the 12 months. but. Most of the of the time that I was at Fort Bliss, I was the S3 of the Defense Language Institute Southwest uh, Branch. He had a contract uh, with a retired Marine, a guy named uh, Shevek, and Ken Shevek, and he and his uh, uh, senior NCO from Vietnam got a contract to hire Vietnamese nationals and provide the language instruction. A DLI at the because Monterey was filled up, DLI ran training uh, for the eight-week, 12-week, 24-week, and 48-week courses in Vietnamese. And so they, uh, uh, they had people there in training that were there for long term. And it was not only Army people, people for Army people in the longer courses, typically for intelligence community, Army Security Agency and the Air Force Security mm -hmm. Service uh, were all trained there. Uh, they had to perform uh, uh, that Department of Defense form, uh, the security clearance one that lists all the organizations you belong to and so forth. Uh, they had to do that for the Vietnamese uh, nationals who were the teachers. And so I had two guys who were working for me doing these security clearance forms with the Vietnamese instructors and they had been to the 98 week course. Vietnamese, and they were fluent, hmm. and so they could fill out these DD form, the 398, something like that. I never get that form number, but yeah, uh, they did those. But you know, that was a very good assignment. It was nice, and uh, uh, my daughter was born uh, in the uh, in the hospital at uh, at Fort Bliss. So she's an army brat. <laughs> and my my late wife uh, always remembered that because the morning after. Uh, uh, she was delivered, the cannon went off for Reveille, and the nurses came around and made her get out of bed and make her bed. <laughs> <laughs> and she told that story for years. Uh, you did have the second tour then? 
I did have a second term. Went back. Uh, the Army sent me uh, to uh, the Civil Affairs School. And at that time, it was run at Fort Gordon. It was, I think, one of the last classes that graduated from, from Fort Gordon. And it was one of those things, the Civil Affairs School taught you the kinds of things that I had been doing for a year in Vietnam. And so I ended up being the honor graduate of that course. And I was supposed to go to Vietnam and had a staff job in Saigon. And what they say, never volunteer. <laughs> I got in Saigon and, and I said, is there you know, some kind of line infantry job that I can have? Uh, he said, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, we have a, a vacancy for an S-3. And then our 1st Airborne Division, a battalion commander in S-3, were just killed in a helicopter crash. We need, a, we need an infantry officer to go and be, a, uh, be an S-3. So I ended up being S-3 of the 3rd of the 187th Infantry, part of the 101st Airborne Division. And so uh, that was my second tour. And the second tour is 180 degrees out from the first tour. I'm surrounded by Americans, I have all the American conveniences, I can go to the PX, I can go uh, order stuff from the Passex catalog, I have a, a hooch, I have air conditioning, I have a, have a nice bunk, you know, the, the whole nine yards, very, very much Americanized. And uh, But what I did is go down to the chopper pad and get in a helicopter and uh, put rifle companies on hilltops. And uh, 101st Airborne Division had a pretty good SOP about the way they conducted air mobile combat assaults. They would do an artillery prep on a, on a hilltop. Uh, H, let's say H-15 to H-5 is the artillery prep. H-5 to H-1 uh, were, were aerial rocket artillery cobras would go in and make crisscross paths and shoot up the, uh, the LZ. H-1, a light observation helicopter loach would, with a Gatling gun would drop into the clearing and do a 360 work. He would lift out and the lift birds would be uh, on trail. The artillery prep, the last round of the last volley of artillery was WP. Yeah. And they would call tubes clear, uh, rounds on the way. He would observe the fall of shot and see the, the uh, white phosphorus. The helicopter pilot knew that they could begin their run in uh, <laughs> while the uh, while the Cobras were working over the uh, the LZ, come in, land ground time for the helicopters at 10 seconds. Everybody gets out of them, pilots pull pitch and, and get out of there, and uh, and you do it. Uh, one point we were we were on the hill met, hill line north of Way. Uh, there's a line of hills in from the in from the coast. We were on the first line of hills, and there were fire bases along on the on the hilltop. The firebase Rakasan and firebase Jack. Uh, those were set up on hilltops, and then uh, they would do operations uh, out from these fire bases into the into the uh, country that was uh, further back. Did they never put you in charge of a unit on the ground that you were? We had to spend a little bit of time uh, on, on a couple of the fire bases. Didn't really get involved in any patrol activities or uh, things like that. How do you compare the two tours? I, I'd say that the first one, I mean, it's, it's a remarkable thing to live in an Oriental society in total immersion, surrounded by the native mm -hmm. people. You just learn every day about how things go. A little thing like water buffaloes. A staple of Oriental agriculture, but at the time I was there, Kubota came out with a long-stemmed tractor that could be used to plow, and the the water buffalo perhaps was going to go away. The guy I saw flooding, slicing the bamboo, uh, moving to see plastic mats from Taiwan in the marketplace. Things were <laughs> things were changing, and uh, and they remain remain changing. It was a, it was something. So that that true. the U.S. unit experience. I was almost totally isolated from the Vietnamese population. We were on, on fire bases or base camps. Uh, we didn't really go out into the into the local economy. Um, they had Vietnamese workers that, that came uh, onto the base and, and so forth, but we didn't really have, uh, uh, you know, I, I maybe spoke of two or three sentences of Vietnam, Vietnamese in the, uh, 
in the time that I was uh, with the 101st. It was you know, totally different. So. What about the return this time? Was that a different <coughs> experience? I'm trying to remember, we came into McCord, and I think we were, uh, oh yeah, they told us to change into civilian clothes yeah. to travel back from McCord. And I didn't have any incidents in the airport. I didn't have anybody, uh, you know, I, I wonder, I often wonder how I would have reacted. Uh, considering, you know, American soldiers and the fact that they were involved in combat, it's really miraculous that some more people didn't get annihilated. You know, they come in and call me a baby killer, you know, and I, I you know, you might react, but I, I have to, to really credit to the people who were in Vietnam is that they, they swallowed their feelings and, and just let these people rant on. Uh, it's, uh, it's, I think it's, it's a really great thing about it. My wife did forbid me from television for about six months after I got back. Yep. Watching the news? Yeah. I would be hollering, you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> they were. And so, uh, yeah, it was, um, it was but by and large, I found Vietnam veterans in society. When I was working in, in business, I was doing business with them the people of the telephone company in Tennessee, and had been calling on these people and going out to lunch with them for maybe six or eight months. And we were on a business trip to watch a, a facility that was in operation. And we were at dinner one night and somebody said the magic word, you know, it turns out of the four men in the group, three of them had been in the military during Vietnam and the fourth one had been in the National Guard during the Washington mm -hmm. riots. Nobody said anything about their military experience. I think that's probably a characteristic of Vietnam veterans. You know, we don't talk about it. You, know, so you, you talk to another Vietnam veteran, then you will open up and you'll talk about it. And it, it's true. And uh, my next door neighbor is a Vietnam veteran. One of the other guys in the subdivision is a Vietnam veteran. We can talk about those things. And uh, I do. But uh, the other thing is, it, it's astonishing to me to realize how long ago that was. 1969, 89, 89, 2000, 45 years, and uh, but as I, 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 I took a lot of pictures and I have a lot of memories and I think it was a, a, my feelings about it is we went, we did the job we were sent to do, and we came back, and I think that that was a, that's the way you sum up what the experience was for me. Was it dangerous? Yes. Did we do things that that you know a normal person would not think are logical, sure. Walk through a minefield, walk through an area that you know is mined. Uh, walk through the area that you know is mined the second time, okay? Uh, I, I think, well, I think my, I think my little RTO, uh, the Italian guy from, uh, uh, from New Jersey, uh, Tony Corbella, uh, he was a draftee. He went up the hill because I went up the hill. He was there and got blown up with me. He didn't get wounded. You know, he was he was far enough away from the explosion. But I looked him up. I found him on Google. Google Anthony A. Corbell. Now, mm -hmm. he lives in New Jersey. How many Italians, <laughs> how many Italian people are in New Jersey? Enormous population. I got him on the first shot. I called him up and I said, is this the Anthony Corbell that served in Vietnam? He said, how'd you find me? <laughs> Yeah, I got together with him. I met his family. He's married. He has a daughter, and doing just fine. And so, uh, it's nice to see that uh, uh, and to do him. I, I I got in touch with my one commanding officer, uh, the second one, the West Pointer. I had a friend from business who was a military academy graduate. And I gave him this guy's name, and of course, West Pointers. They have this network. Uh, he twenty four hours later, he said, "Here's where he is. Here's his contact information." Mm -hmm. and I got a hold of him. I had all these photos that I had taken and I put them on discs and uh, I made a set of discs and gave them to this, uh, this retired colonel. He had left the army as a lieutenant colonel, retired, went to work for a, a defense industry outfit and retired from them and was living in retirement in Colorado. So, you know, he came back all right too. Any particular uh, thoughts you'd like to insert? I'm kind of running out of I have the feeling that we're that we're winding down. I, mean, I think that it's nice to be able to go back now and 
talk to people in an academic environment uh, and teach them about what went on. Uh, I was reading the comments we got from students. We had a co-taught a course last semester in military and diplomatic history, and the students do a, an evaluation form. And um, one of the students put down, what did you like best? And he said, Dr. Pierce's comments about the, uh, uh, about the real life uh, activities. I explained some of the stuff to the to the students, and they recognized it as the primary source material. Mm -hmm. I think that should do it. Though. I'm sure that I will remember lots more. <laughs> <laughs>